to the Munich Security Conference where the French leader, Emmanuel Macron, is now addressing delegates. Let's take a listen. Unfortunately, I cannot welcome each and every one of you here in the room. There's company representatives here, Christoph Heusken, head of the MSC, esteemed friends. I'm very happy that we can get together here today uh, at in this spot where for the past 60 years, I believe it is now, discussions have been held that structure our world, discussions that have led to new considerations in the transatlantic bond. Today, we heard from President Zelensky and from Federal Chancellor Scholz, my previous speakers, and uh, now I have to say that, speaking after them, that it is very apparent that the situation is very serious. Almost a year has passed since the catastrophic war of aggression was launched by Russia in Ukraine. And even though the time for conclusions has not yet come, I think we should look ahead anyway or maybe take stock in a certain way. Of course, in my deliberations today, I would like to focus on the war Russia is waging in Ukraine. But at the same time, we must not forget that there are other wars that are being waged in the Middle East, in the Caucasus region. There is a war going on against terrorism. Um, questions of nuclear uh, issues are important as well. But of course, today, Ukraine is at the heart of the matter. After one year, taking stock leads to a very grave result after this catastrophic conflict. And I think I want to highlight one major point today. This war, as opposed to everything we read today, is not only war for the Europeans, it's a, a war that concerns the world as a whole, because there is no justification at all for this aggression. I said this a few months ago already uh, when I spoke at the United Nations. Um, I said that this is a new imperialist attitude that we see that is expressed in this aggression towards a neighbor of which you believe you must not respect their entire territory. And that there is a, a law that needs to be, a right that needs to be claimed. So the assumption that new colonialism and new imperialism were legitimate in this world. And secondly, all taboos were broken through this war of aggression. Not only the Charter of the United Nations was violated, no. It was violated by a member state of the uh, Security Council. There has been systematic destruction of critical infrastructure, civilian infrastructure. Uh, crimes were committed against the Ukrainian population, against civilians, and a nuclear threat is in the room as well. And the work done by Mr. Groshi by the, at the AA is also hugely important, and I would like to value that and appreciate that here. And he's also worked great uh, with Iran. We must not underestimate that. So this war has had devastating consequences, and Russia only is responsible for this crisis, a crisis also of food supply, for example, despite the measures that we have uh, taken in solidarity to the benefit of the countries that uh, require our protection the most. Those who believe that this is a European matter, well, to those, I say there's only one aggressor and only one party that was attacked. The, this is clear. And we must not um, want a stable international organization uh, uh, structure uh, without stepping up for it. And the second, my second consideration is this. It is the case that Russia's aggression has basically been crowned by four clear defeats. The first defeat is the defeat on the battlefield. The basic assumption for, of Russia was that this war was going to be quick, that Ukraine cannot resist and will fall within a few days or maybe within a few weeks at most, and that the matter was settled. The incredible bravery of the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian people people of the political leadership in Ukraine, especially, uh, and also of those friends who are here today, the, including the president that we've seen on screen earlier, um, all that, that those that have shown this bravery thwarted this plan. The North couldn't be taken, and then we saw what happened in Kherson. You know, we all remember this. And all this is a defeat of the original military plan of Russia. The second defeat is the defeat of the 
colonial mentality. So the point was to create confusion to also create spheres of influence and to act as though there was a legitimacy for this war of aggression. But that did not work out. Even a year later, this hasn't worked out. So what this is about is to explain that Russia is a power today that creates imbalances and injustices, not only in Ukraine or in the Caucasus or in Africa with the Wagner Group. We have seen this over the past few years. Um, we have seen how Russia proceeds, and I talked to President Putin about a year ago, and back then I believed him in a way when he told me that the Wagner group doesn't belong to him. Um, but now these troops, these, this group is now official, quote-unquote, and it's been a direct military means or tool or even a diplomatic tool that Russia is employing. It's a new mafiosi tool that Russia is using everywhere, and it is used to create uh, crimes and uh, commit crimes and create injustice. And the third defeat is a defeat, let's say a defeat looking into the future. Because the result is a consolidation of Ukraine and its forces and the decision by Sweden and Finland to join NATO. And I would like to tell the representatives here uh, how much we support them, the representatives of these countries. We want more international cooperation. There is a lot of mistrust towards Russia that has taken root, and self-defense has become more important. But now, in the Caucasus, how can we assume that the challenge there can be solved by Russia, by a state that is so neo-colonial in its um, behavior? I was reassured by the president there that this is not uh, the path to go down. And the fourth defeat concerns me. Uh, president Putin wanted to give Russia what supposedly it wanted, which is um, a claim in the world. So how could Russia uh, be happy with just being an exporter of raw materials and not being a nation that is important in the world? How can Russia just be a medium-sized power um, that causes mistrust from all its neighbors? Be but that is now what the situation is. Two years ago, I shared this exact view here. Nobody can change the geography of Russia. Russia will always remain a part of Europe, geographically speaking, and nobody here in this room can solve this dilemma that there is no complete and long-term peace in our continent as long as the Russian matter has not been solved in a reasonable fashion and without uh, complacency. But we have to continue in this spirit, spirit, and we have to take this seriously. And this is what I have been underlining time and again. Once the conflict has start, had started, we must not be naive, show unity, um, act vigorously, and pursue dialogue as well, wherever it is possible. But at the moment, the hour of dialogue hasn't come yet because Russia chose war. Russia chose to even intensify this war. Russia has decided to attack civilian infrastructure and to commit war crimes. For the short term, the solution is simple. Russia must not and cannot win this war, and Russia's attack must fail. We must not allow that resorting to force or violence becomes normalized, because that uh, puts into question stability in the world. And this is why, together with our European and American partners and many others across the globe, we have, since the beginning of the conflict, created outposts of security. We have imposed sanctions, uh, 10 packages worth of sanctions um, that we have imposed on Russia. And we have provided humanitarian and financial and economic support to Ukraine, to the people of Ukraine, and we also also protected civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. We provided financial means um, and 
Let me thank the Secretary General at this point for everything he's done. And every time France has pursued the path of the greatest value added for Ukraine, for example, uh, by supporting uh, air defense and sending artillery and also training um, Ukrainian armed forces. At the same time, we also made sure that uh, the Ukrainians can be protected, but also Romania and Estonia, for example. We are helping to strengthen and both the defense of the eastern flank of NATO. But also, we are present in the Mediterranean Sea, and we have uh, joint maritime groups there, too. And that, um, as a matter of fact, since the first day of, days of the conflict. Also, there was always the question whether this conflict would spread into Romanian territory. But over time, time and again, we have worked towards um, agreement, basically. And this is my conviction. We need to intensify our support further to undertake more efforts, increase our effort in order to help the Ukrainian people so that Ukraine itself can launch a counter-offensive in order to then, under credible circumstances, enter into a negotiation process chosen by Ukraine. We are ready to intensify our efforts the next few months and weeks will be decisive. But at the same time, we also stand ready to sustain a longer conflict. I don't wish for that. Nobody does, of course. But together, we have to remain credible. We have to remain credible in our perseverance. And this is what France wants to highlight once again today. Unity and determination are important to provide Ukraine with the means to go back to the negotiation table in an acceptable fashion and to work on long-term peace under conditions that the Ukrainians have decided upon and identified. And in this context, I would like to call on all our European friends today. Based on the convictions that I've just shared with you, my first call on you, my first appeal to you is this. We need to invest more in defense. If we want peace, we need the means to achieve it. France, in this regard, is um, putting in its fair share. So uh, in November, we passed the strategic compass, and now we are working on a new report for defense for the 24 to 2030 time frame. Uh, we will provide a significant uh, number uh, as of uh, euros to support those uh, efforts, and we have to do more as allies. But rearming ourselves also means that we that we need to strengthen the European defense technological and industrial base, and all the means that we have developed recently. Uh, through the agenda of Versailles a year ago need to be reinforced as well. We need to continue up on this path. Also, the Ukrainian armed forces need to be enabled to continue on that path too, including with industrial support from Europe. And if Ukraine is supposed to defend Europe, it needs to be armed accordingly. It needs to be interoperable with Europe and production capacities need to be ramped up also across Europe. We need an investment program for defense, which is ambitious in all of Europe, so that we can uh, make the best out of the European Defense Fund. We also do have to change, maybe, or think about changing our rhythm. The war industry that we have been wanting to strengthen in France since spring is something where we need more progress. We need more standardization, more simplification at the European level. And my second appeal now is this. We should also consider the nuclear aspect of this matter. There, there are non-verbalized questions in this war, and nuclear issues are one of those. Nuclear weapons are. Russia's attack took place in the shadow of nuclear weapons, and of course we need to protect our allies. But at the same time, this was also a wake-up call for us. We need to ask ourselves what role do nuclear weapons play in the EU and in NATO. French deterrence has a very decided 
but together with the UK, together we are responsible for the security of the alliance, and of course the Americans play a key role in this regard. And so I wish that once again we underline the nuclear features of our alliance and that we consider once again what that means. And I would like to repeat what I said in February at the Ecole de Guerre, a dialogue with our partners on nuclear's, uh, France, France's nuclear deterrence and what Europe derives from that is crucial. And thirdly, I would also like to call on all of us to rethink our security doctrine. Europe should, in all questions of arms control, have its place. I'm thinking of um, medium-range rockets and missiles. Um, at one of the most recent NATO meetings, I underlined, and you may recall how important those weapons are. The United States has decided to not pursue certain contracts or agreements or treaties further, and they concerned our territory, and we were not involved here. So basically, we were a geopolitical minority, and that needs to end. It is about the security of Europe that is at stake. We need to think about this, we need to provide this type of security, and we need to guarantee it together with our NATO partners, but also as Europeans. This, uh, the INF treaty uh, was discussed uh, over the past few years, but we were not invited uh, to that, and th so there is no treaty uh, anymore like the INF, um, and we have to draw conclusions from that. That would have an added value also for the European uh, defense posture and would strengthen our capabilities in defense and reinvigorate them as well if we had a tool like the INF Treaty again that no longer exists. And that also ties in with a more general topic that Federal Chancellor Scholz just uh, brought up, which is air defense here on the European continent. And I think it was uh, right that President Charles raised the issue of air defense. We, Germans, British, French, who want to join in this effort should have a conference on air defense in Europe. We should have a conference on that, including with industrial industry representatives, um, in inviting all those who have solutions to offer here. But also from a strategic point of view, we need to consider this, especially from a strategic point of view. But at the same time, deterrence and uh, effects uh, in the depth need to be uh, considered. This is a central question for Europe. Europe needs to have its place in a future security order. My fourth appeal to you is this. What mechanism could we have that could prevent a cycle of aggression? We need a framework of transparency, of predictability in Europe with simple principles like inviolability of borders, sovereignty of states, the stabilizing role of Europe that we should underline. So we need an architecture that is credible with arms control and finally, we also need a framework that prevents crises, including long-term crises on the continent. Of course, we will use, we can use existing structures like the OSCE, and of course, Europe needs to be at the heart of this. I'm not thinking dogmatically here. There, there is the EU, yes, but I think we need to think e the Europe bigger just as we've done uh, through the European political community that uh, has to play a special role in this regard. Some partners have decided to leave the European Union, but they are a member of the European political community. They are partners in energy and security, and they share so many topics with us. And there are other countries that want to join the European Union, and I hope they will do it. Today, they're quite far from it. I think Norway um, and the UK, Moldova, Ukraine, you know, this is a Euro European political community that has the opportunity to prevent crises like that and to create the architecture I just outlined. I would like to uh, reassure the president of Moldova of our support once again. 
She's facing so many challenges and has faced them and mastered them. So we need a space for cooperation on our continent. And NATO plays a very fundamental, a key role here. And the last few months have shown that all those who believed that strength, the strengthening of the European pillar with NATO was a threat for NATO have understood now that this basically strengthened our alliance because, of course, this is just logical to act this way and that with this, with this we have shown our determination to reach strategic goals together. And now two more appeals to our European partners. So my fifth appeal, in addition to the current conflict, we need to pull together in the future when it comes to other conflicts that are a threat to us already now. There is a risk that we're all facing. It's the risk of something that could happen in the next weeks or months, which is more geopolitical shifts. We could potentially see new forms of conflicts in new spaces like the cyberspace or in the maritime sphere. We must not forget the vulnerability of our dem democracies when it comes to destabilization campaigns and disinformation campaigns. These spheres will be exploited, maybe by Russia, but also maybe by other authoritarian powers that in this context target our uh, the destabilization of us. So we have to pool our capacities and our investments and work together more strongly in this area. And now my last appeal to all Europeans, but also everyone beyond Europe, also including uh, the United States, is this. Let's prepare peace. For the short term, we need to be strong and determined, and we need to be willing to persevere. Already now, we need to prepare the conditions for peace. This is our responsibility. But this is not about uh, making bad compromises. No, we need a credible peace, because a credible peace will be durable. But we will have to be prepared and create the conditions for this peace. And that means that we need to work with everyone, let's say, in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific, in the Middle East, in Latin America and Africa. We need to be in touch with our partners in those regions who maybe do not fully share our views that I just outlined. And as I said earlier in the beginning, we are often being accused of not speaking the truth, um, of not being quite honest. You know, you spend so much money on Ukraine. We have faced war th wars for years, and you never spent any money's money on us. You know, we need to listen to these concerns. We need to listen to those countries and to those regions. And together with those countries from those regions, we need to step up together and exert pressure on Russia and create a long-lasting peace. And so that means, finally, that we have to fight this narrative of uh, double standards. I want to call on the G20 and the G7 to stand by us to create a partnership, partnership of the South and the North in order to strengthen solidarity at the international stage to the benefit of health, education, the fight of food scarcity and basically creating more credibility for richer countries and countries that are un currently undergoing developments. You know, we need to help those countries. We need to show them how we defend our principles towards a durable and just peace in Ukraine. We want a more fair, a more just world. We want a world that can tackle the challenges of climate change in those countries, but also in other places. But responsibility is indispensable. And in all of that, we must not forget what the responses are to this new geopolitical environment. It also needs to be a military, military answer. It must be a response of resolve. We need to commit ourselves to a credible peace, to a strengthened and enhanced policy of solidarity. So that was a quite, long, quite a long speech. And I thank you for your attention, and thank you for letting me share with you my convictions today. Merci beaucoup. Merci. En fait, deux questions. Okay. Oui. Okay. 
I have two questions. President, Is that thank possible? Thank you very much for your speech. It had an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage was it was very comprehensive. The disadvantage was we don't have much time for questions. And uh, I will not ask you questions, but I ask the public who didn't get to ask uh, questions to uh, the German Chancellor. So you have a question for two, uh, two questions. Um, uh, for the president, I take the two questions right after another, and um, the first one doesn't even need to raise his hand, uh, François Eisbuch. <laughs> Can we have, get a mic? <laughs> uh, a, uh, short, short. No, oh, très, très court. Uh, uh, Monsieur le Président, Yes, just briefly, Mr. President, do you think that there's any chance that there will be a long-lasting peace with Russia because you just said um, Russia will remain a part of Europe always? So if Russia doesn't bury its dreams to create a big empire yet again, just as it happened in France with regards to the war in Algeria, you know, don't you think there is any Just chance, any shred of hope? No, no, we, we do it. No other question? Yes, there, over, please. Uh, Monsieur le Président, I'm going to speak in English, but I'm in your vision of a new global order and a durable peace. Does that include reforming the Security Council to actually give political weight and voice to all these other countries? Look, um, I will start with a second question. I, yes, definitely. I think we have to reshape our global order. I think first, and for me this is why this is a, a huge emergency, we have to rebalance our global order and make it more inclusive. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by how much we are losing the trust of the global south. I will be very clear and tough with ourselves. Why? Because for good reasons, they felt that this world was quite unbalanced. They felt that during the COVID-19 period of time, even if we did a lot, there was a double standard approach. We committed to do more afterwards. We had a wonderful summit. IMF made a, a tremendous job, WHO as well, for the Global South. But we committed, and, but we delivered very slowly. Look at the SDRs. We did it. We pushed very much. But so many countries didn't do so, for good reasons at home. But they didn't see the money. And on top of that, now they, have, they are impacted by the consequences of this war. So they just say, when, when the war is on your territory, is your top priority. You are ready to spend money. You have magnitude and speediness, but it's not the same for us. And at the same time, you have an acceleration of, the, of their challenges, inequalities, demography, climate change, and direct consequences. So I think for me, the top priority is to restore more solidarity. This is why I do believe this new partnership between South and North is key. And we will organize a conference in June in Paris with all the, the, the big international organization and countries precisely to try to help and accelerate the reform of IMF, World Bank, and so on, but as well reshape the global order and the inclusiveness of the different forum. Part of it, definitely, is the Security Council. Let's be clear. One permanent member just decided to kill the rules of what he was supposed to look for. So, we have to reform it and to reshape it. As for um, this dream of empire and uh, the Russian mindset, I'm convinced that this war, this is not a justification, but an explanation. This war is the consequence of the fact that probably nobody in Europe properly digested the end of the Cold War. Neither the Europeans nor the Russians. We thought ourselves that it was the honeymoon, the end of a wall, and everything could be repaired. Access to the European Union, new democratic standards, and a new global order. You don't change the society and what people experience during decades overnight. 
And even by the way ourselves as Europeans we approach the consequence of the situation, we probably underestimated the importance of national culture in some countries in Europe joining the EU. We probably underestimated the in-depth crisis and this time for transition. And we didn't think properly, it was exactly what I advocated a few years ago, but probably I formulated it and I advocated too late, but I was elected in 17. But the relationship with Russia. And I think in our, way, in our own approach vis-à-vis -vis Russia, we didn't digest it. But very clearly, I think Russia didn't digest the end of an empire. And I think the, uh, clearly the deep reason of this aggression is resentment post-1990 and obsession of geopolitical empire. And when you have, look at the situation, an average GDP, a declining demography, you are the biggest country of this world with a lot of borders, especially with China and some good fellows. If you want to fix your future, you need some crazy dreams. So either you have a dream of growth and innovation, the one you, we could hope, either you have a, draw, a, a dream of uh, a new Europe based on peace, innovation, education, and so on, or you resume the old dream of empire based on hegemony and aggression. This is this one. Is, I, I, I'm very skeptical about the ability of make a big reset on the short run, and I don't see any signal on that. The question is how, let's be clear, I don't believe one sec in a regime change. And when I, when I hear a lot of people advocating for regime change, I, I would just ask them for which change? Who's next? Who is your leader? How to implement it? And we experienced several times during the past decade a lot of regime change in a lot of countries. It's total failure. So just you have this regime with its obsessions, its people. We want first to help Ukraine to save its territory, its people in sovereignty. And I think the question is how to twist and create an imperfect balance, allowing them to present something sustainable for Russia itself. At the end of the day, it will be something like that. It's too early to formulate it. Now, the question is how to resist, help the Ukrainian to make on the ground something which will force Russia to come back at the table at the conditions of Ukraine. But at the point of time, given the geography, we will have to negotiate. I think in the back of their mind, this regime, these people will have the same dream. The question is how to make the new normal acceptable for them and sustainable for all of us. I think we have some ways, they are quite complicated, definitely it's not the right time to formulate them, but we have to work on that. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. President. There are some open questions, so we hope you'll come back next year to respond to these questions. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and all the best for our Ukrainian friends.